Our difficulty is not with regard to the ultimate. Our difficulty is with regard to the beginning. Long years ago, we made a tryst with destiny. And now the time comes when we shall redeem our pledge. How do you not appreciate how potent and powerful is the story of India's constitution when the chairman of your drafting committee is the son of an untouchable? Here is a man who documents his childhood as, as being forced to sit at the back of a classroom, to so not being able to drink water from the collective pool of water. If we walk long enough, must necessarily lead us to unity. This constitution is not just a text, it is a deep romance that these drafters had with their country. We don't enable young people to understand that it is built on not just a kind of unexamined love, but it is built on an introspective affection for the fraternal nature of our constitution project and this country. How do you not fall in love with this project? They're doing this, and the backdrop to all of this, obviously, is partition. Uh, refugees are flowing into Delhi, flowing into Purana Killa. Uh, Purana Killa, if you know the topography of Delhi, is, is 10 minutes from parliament. It's five minutes, not even five minutes, it's four minutes from the Supreme Court. The geography of it should also be your moral compass, I think, as a citizen, because it is a parliament that stands very close to a court, that stands very close to these backdrops of where the physical spaces where people who were displaced were coming not just for shelter but were coming to find a country. That parliamentarians were making what would be a liberal text, a document that was located in an inclusive character, in dignity, as opposed to hate. It was very easy to have gone down that route of locating this in fear, in hate, of creating an other uh, citizen, which was happening across the border, uh, and not going that route explicitly picking a different way and that different way despite partition despite violence on all sides and like let's be clear this is religious hatred that is fueling that violence of partition it's hindus muslims sikhs everyone setting on each other right um, uh, we know these stories well of trains you know traversing the borders and ending up on the other side of the border full of bodies both ends of the border uh, so we have gone through this cycle and this is the context, this is the context to the creation of our constitution. That we don't have museums, public museums that document this is a great failing because without those public museums, generations do not know what happened and generations have not been prepared educationally to make sure that it never happens again. So the context, the current political context of religious hate, uh, of otherizing minorities, uh, of turning on each other, of beef pans and lynchings has happened before in a larger, in, in kind of the scale was just much larger. But the question is, you know, do you learn from your history or do you not? The Germans, for instance, have gone the other way. Right? So they have created a memory culture. You cannot walk around Berlin and not be confronted with the Holocaust, not be confronted with what happened. German children are educated uh, as to how, you know, a stable constitution enabled this. Uh, the rise of Hitler through popular politics enabled this, enabled the wiping out of a minority who were citizens as to who we were and who we chose to become. And who we chose to become was explicitly in this document not that kind of country which would be majoritarian. I teach um, you know, a comparative law course uh, at Columbia. We have the B.R. Ambedkar chair there. More recently, I've started examining sort of 
America, the, the, the United States, which is really considered this harbinger of kind of individual rights and, you know, a kind of a cosmopolitan, if you will, citizenship. And you know what is fascinating is how little American constitutionalism did to make reparations for slavery, right? I mean, there is no question the American constitutional model is formal equality. So you and I might come from entirely different backgrounds. I may come from three generations of slaves and then emancipation. You may come from four generations of slave owners and abject privilege. Apparently, you and I will be treated similarly by the law. There is no effort to either make reparations or no effort to imagine institutions which will enable some sort of remedial action. Contrast that with the Indian constitution's text as well as the jurisprudence of the court of a kind of an emancipatory constitution which not only makes reparations for the caste system uh, and the inhuman sort of degradation of generations and generations uh, of lower caste Indians but which actually talks about setting aside in public employment, uh, in political office uh, and the jurisprudence of the court, you know, in, in terms of public education and educational institutions, all of which is geared towards this very simple but radical revolutionary constitutional uh, quest of making reparations, of really doing justice, where there has been hundreds of years or maybe thousands of years of injustice, right? I think sometimes when you're in India, you don't realize the radical nature of that project. This idea that we will make amends for what has happened, because that is the only way that you will narrow existing inequality, is a truly radical idea because it has been tried successfully in a liberal democracy, never. It has never been tried before. I think this idea of everybody today wanting to jump on to that project of reparations is not the constitutional scheme. This is not a division of state riches. This is really about ameliorating historical disadvantage. Historical disadvantage that has been held in place by the caste system. I have little to say to those who are being politically opportunistic and want to jump onto that in a contemporary telling, even though there is clearly those communities don't suffer from that kind of historical disadvantage. But I do think we need to really interrogate if caste disadvantage continues, if a young Dalit groom needs police protection to take his bridal party across villages in UP today still and across upper caste villages, then we have a real... No, we don't just have a political problem. We have a constitutional issue, right? But if that still exists, if temple entry is still forbidden to women, to folks of ca certain castes, then we have a constitutional problem. Um, and I think if you are interested as a citizen in appreciating the ills of your country and the ills of what, have, what has happened, and if you want to be part of the solution, then you necessarily have to engage historical disadvantage. You necessarily have to engage the expectations of this constitution. And you necessarily have to be invested in keeping the promises of this constitution. And the promises of this constitution are an equal dignity. You cannot arrive at an equal dignity without making reparations. At the time, there was a lot of criticism of it saying that, you know, I mean, especially, you know, Western political theorists saying that, come on, how can, how can you have universal adult franchise in a country with this kind of illiteracy? But of course, much was said, how can you have democracy in a country of such diversity and divisions, right? India kind of confounds uh, those assumptions, uh, where you have uh, lower income folk voting at higher rates. Uh, than well-to-do folk. I think part of this idea of universal dal franchise comes from kind of there actually having been a party that had political alliances across the spectrum uh, with the landless, 
with the middle class. So it really comes, I suspect, from rubbing shoulders with each other, uh, from staging those salt satyagras together, um, from actually serving time in prison together. So I think from there comes this belief also that each citizen must be able to cast her franchise, must be able to exercise her franchise and that each citizen across that spectrum of income, literacy, region, language, caste, ethnicity will be able to make a well-informed choice. It is, I think that, that belief comes from it and I think largely, I mean, we, one may agree or disagree individually with who comes to power but I think one cannot disagree with the fact that the Indian franchise project has been one of great success. Women within all religions are claiming more space. This is not just the Supreme Court judge who is creating freedom. This is Muslim women who want more space. This is Hindu women who want more space. Christian women, Parsi women. These are women who are pushing for reform within these communities. The real problem is not the dynamic between equality and the freedom of religion. The real problem is between dynamic religion as it is practiced through custom and usage and codified religion, which is static in personal law. So to my mind, the question really is, is that when you codify a regressive religious interpretation, you are not making provision for the way people would like to live their lives and the way people are living their lives, whether it's on marriage, divorce, succession, inheritance, maintenance, what have you. So this is why Hindu women are going to court or Muslim women are going to court and saying, you know, reform divorce law or reform access to temples. I mean, because who is making these demands? It is people from within the community. And who is speaking for the women of all these religions? Why is it that it is mostly elderly men who are deciding what is freedom of religion? when this country is a young country across religious communities. That's, that's what I find interesting, that why is it not young women who are being asked to interpret uh, their religious beliefs and their religious freedoms. So I think the problem here is not the tussle of secular India and freedom of religion. I think the problem here is how we understand religion. And in a country where I think faith is important, Nonetheless, the young Indian is living his or her life in a modern setting across faith. Within the Constituent Assembly, they were trying to get a lot done. And they were also trying to arrive at this kind of incremental approach, you know. And sort of Hannah Lerner writes about this, you know, you're sort, of, uh, you're sort of deflecting the most controversial. But I think they were doing something else, right? There, there was an expectation in the Constituent Assembly that you would achieve the directive principles of state policy, that these would be guiding norms, including the Uniform Civil Code. There is an expectation of achievement. Right? The Constitution's idea of India, to my mind, you know, um, is that classroom, right? Like, and I always think of it as this is that classroom where you have kids, you know, across the religious spectrum, across the class spectrum, young girls and boys, and who are having this good, informed, questioning conversation about their future and what would they grow up to, what would they like to grow up to be. And to my mind, I've always hoped that those conversations in that classroom would be Young girls, not just young boys, but young girls saying that I would like to grow up to be Chief Justice of India. I would like to grow up to be Prime Minister of India. Uh, I would like to grow up to be an artist or a cricketer. And that there is an expectation and a belief, a well-founded belief, that you will not be held back because of your gender or your orientation or your caste or your ethnicity, or your language, or your political persuasion. To my mind, that is the Constitution's India. The Constitution's India is not an India of segregated neighborhoods. It is not an India where we have an unrepresentative parliamentary system. It is not an India of one religion. It is not an India where, we, where our political class cracks homophobic jokes. It is not an India 
where a political class negates one minority or any minority in this country because I think the idea of India of the constitution is an understanding and that's the point right that India is the majority in India is it's a majority of minorities it is an India where the minorities are low caste women religious minorities sexual minorities and when you bring them together that is the majority of this country and I think there has to be a political appreciation of that because the constitution gets it right on that. It gets that this is a country where you accumulate the minorities, they are the majority in this country. And they have not spoken for far too long.